Graduate Programs Coordinator here at Cranbrook, for those of you that don't know me. Um, tonight, I'm here to welcome a very special guest, Chris Tisch, though no stranger to the Academy. Chris Tisch is a poet, playwright, and translator, as well as the author of several collections of poetry and plays. She is also this year's 2014 2D Department Visiting Poet. Her work has taken form as an experimental mixture of translation and creative writing. She explores the tensions of gender identity, community, violence, and incarceration. The physical books are as mesmerizing as her words, some bound small and intimate, the text nestled on tops and the bottoms of pages, making space for the words to breathe. Cultural critic Joanna Drucker once characterized Tish as possessed of a singular sensual intellect. She was born in Paris and holds an MA in, in American Literature from the Sorbonne. She has been widely published. Her poems, reviews, and essays have appeared in Chicago Review, Jacket, Lipstick, Metro Times, Poetry Flash, and many others. She edits Marx and Online Quarterly. Her Motor City drama, Car Men, A Play in D, was staged at the Detroit Institute of Arts here in Detroit. And A Fable for Clara Kay was staged at the Hillbury Studio Theater in 2010. She is a recipient of the 2003 National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship and a 2010 Kresge Artist Fellowship. On the faculty of the Indi English Department at Wayne State University, she teaches creative writing and women's studies. She has given numerous readings in New York, LA, San Francisco, Paris, Prague, just to name a few. Tish will be spending a good part of the year here with the 2D department conducting intensive poetry seminars, and she is a very welcome addition to our community. Elliot Earls, who cannot be here tonight, has asked me to relay that this series of seminars has been an absolutely essential component of the department this year, and I know his students would agree. So on behalf of the 2D department, please help me welcome Chris Tisch. Thank you all for coming, and it's a real pleasure to uh, return a favor as I look at your art, and I'm so impressed in, in the one-on-one -on -one, uh, visits that I make, so it's only fair that I share some of my work with you. Is the mic position okay? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read from uh, a bunch of different things, starting from uh, a play which I wrote um, to kind of commemorate uh, my mother's uh, life. When my mother passed away, I made a little note on the computer and um, told myself to, to write something about her. And then uh, I totally froze for about a year. I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, but I knew I wanted to do something. So my mother, uh, being a Holocaust survivor, had a very heroic life and uh, was an uh, inspiring person. Um, and then it's only when I realized that I had the shape that uh, the work was going to take that I could actually undertake the project. And the shape I realized was going to be a play, a concert of voices rather than a poem. And the minute I had that idea of the form, of the shape of it, then I just started uh, to work on it. So I'll, I'll read from various uh, scenes. And uh, what you need to know is that uh, my uh, theater work is very uh, non-traditional. It's what's called poet's theater. So the premium is more on language than the dramatic action, even though uh, seeing it fully staged with a huge cast was um, very dramatic. <laughs> So this is called Night Scales, a fable for Clara K. Clara is, was the name of my mother. Prologue. Begin with a quotation. She listened to me. Like you, I know what it is to forget. He, no, you don't know what it is to forget. Like you, I have a memory. I know what it is to forget. No, you don't have a memory. Like you, I too have tried with all my might not to forget. Like you, I forgot. Like you, I wanted to have an inconsolable memory, a memory of shadow and stone. And quotation, right. The translation begins. 
a platform bed on a stage, barren, exposed walls as if unfinished, tears and events, after the stop clock, after disaster, artfully reconstituted, boarded up windows, the ramshackle brigade of personal effects of someone on the run, a suitcase in hand, right, ich habe alles vergessen. What do you see, Mnemosine? Do you hear the trains? You once counted them, and two, three, four, five, six, under the mute gray sky. Is it time yet? Is it someone you once knew, soft, pale shawl left behind, where one enters at night like a thief, a ghost walking on bones, dogs smelling your blood, stain on back of skirt, spreading, whistling the warning, tear up the photo now. Tell them how you swallow each pellet until you finger nothing more than the torn lining of a winter coat. For an eternity, framed in the doorway, I summon you like that. I pose you as if history didn't have a hand in it. Then sew your garment herself, stitch by runa stitch, the green felt you parade in after the liberation, all eyes agog <coughs> as you march on, oblivious to the chain of signs. How dare she wear that bosch rag now? I find it hard not to return to yesterday's bind, shown today too heavy for words, too deep, it seems, for the measure between lines blown off shards. Um, my mother actually paraded in Paris uh, in, a, in a coat that was made from a German officer's uh, uh, uniform, and the Parisians were aghast. So they were literally uh, looking at her, and she had no idea why she was being looked at. Scene three, end of theater. Somewhere on a pebble beach, an abandoned scout car. The idea of a play at another way station, unlit and unattended. Supplies blocked at the entrance to the highway. No one to stamp the historical material, no one to say go. Impassable bridge between the lyrics of a partisan, ouvriers et paysans, c'est l'alarme, and what we know. One night, in a small town on the Atlantic wall, a heap of wires and grease rags make a space by the water. La voix est au maquis, speak partisan. Meet me by the bridge, be almost daybreak, remember. No, sorry. Meet me by the bridge, it will be almost daybreak, remember not to shout. I remember, I see the ink. Behind the rye field, the others will join up later. Corpses, scavenged, shells, spread out language, bright dead hero, heavy with sleep. I see the daylight, I see my life, your death. This is how to know dust. This is how to say nothing, even if it kills you. This is how to forge a document with nothing more than shit water. This is how to destroy a garrison. The convoy is on its way. This is how to crawl through the sewer. Bless mon cœur d'une longueur monotone. This is how to blow up a train. It was his first crush. Remember my father's orchard. The crop should be high. This is how to say I do. This is how to watch belly down the arson charge. They had no time for the flames. This is how to tread with wooden shoes, move spur tracks in a partisan song. Stay still. Ami, entends-tu le vol noir des corbeaux sur nos plaines? This is how one gums the work will take them by surprise. Below the viaduct, the green park begins the time of always. She, Hiroshima, that's your name. He, that's my name. Your name is Nevers, Nevers in France. That yellow silkworm spins the smallest cloth piece. Imagine me wearing that story as if mine, its material so threadbare, one can barely read it in this light. This is uh, from Act Two, Scene Two. Two or three clerks in dark breeches, bent at the waist, 
high before them, stacks of personal IDs, passports of all kinds and vouchers. With strangely exaggerated gestures, they stamp each one expired, thud, thunk, flump. Like Molloy sucking stones, the stacks move left to right, from one pile to the next, without ever growing less. Sonia Zussman, Paula Tarsis, Isaac Tarsis, Bella Glassman, Mark Moroz, Steffi Bender, Jakob Bronstein, Bruno Schulz, Ira and Lev Goldberg, Edmund Weiner, David Baruch, Rosenfeld, Apfelbaum, Solomon Walla. Whoa, slow down. We're not doing peace work here. You'll get your grub when night comes. What's the hurry? There's more where that came from. Yeah, what's the difference? Who wants to know? Maiden status, place of birth, father's patronymic, book of mysteries of destruction. You got a train to catch, places to be? I didn't think so. Don't you get it? It's a block of rocks, a lullaby of names underground without a coffin. Don't I get it? In this play, there's only one time, one space, and that is here in the likeness of death, closer to the ramp than we thought possible what we call words of slaughter, gossamer hands pouring out blood like water in the first car, the beginning of pox, it's always midnight, impossible to memorize the bitter alphabet, who might fasten to the rails, who might suffocate and press north, the rat that bites become a silence, broken skull, launch into eternity, floating, adornment under the stars, the few we guard from oblivion's tomb made of sand, hard slog to find the voice which writes the scene, even when there are no witnesses to the blue murder, buried now like a ground wire, safe and sound in the knowledge of suffering on the mourner's bench, the images in the head when we let the ghost speak with that quaver note, the day I first attempted their book, the rhythm of that circle, day after day, nothing but paper names, burnt flesh inside comet with a bull's eye, worms for tongue and tied to us already in the wrong box, wrong cart, wrong hole, out of practice, soft or rusty, not what one used to be. Um, just two more. Uh, this is a monologue. Object lesson. An old man in a yellow hat, the very emblem of history, lends his torn coat to partition the stage, hangs it across like a volleyball net to split it in two, define the boundaries, an equivocal bill of divorce. See that boy scaling a wall? Imagine the crowds that watch as we are led to the gateways. Draw a line or a circle. Be careful of what you say. On this side, there's a park with a kiosk like a gazebo. Music is heard on special days, streaming down the slope. A simple, pretty song, small trees, pink and early cherry blossom. The stranger cannot inherit that story. His partition, some call it a score, calls out for other events, other sounds. If he winds up on the dank streets after lockdown, light disappears. Write what happens next in the lacy penumbra at the border of town. Do not enter the park. He sang the narrow space on the other side of the page, holds the boy as he slips his armband off, careful of that blackbird that skulks after him and takes off in a noisy panic as if he were the one they were after. Where is he now? Wretched, tightly packed, walled off and branded black columns of figures escape in a swarm, fly in throngs toward the notion of forgetting, but the trace has left its ink, permanent mark on the stem. See that boy scaling the high wall? I'm good at smuggling and delivering arms, knives and bread, wrapped like grenades around my ribs. The goods fatten me up for a moment, then I jump like a skater or maybe a black cat between poles. Because of my youth, alarm hides in their eyes, but mine are all steel, latched to the gray bricks I pet with my naked hands. Come close. Now mark a spot, yes, here and there, more like an outline, skeleton fence to shade in the interior. You know the rest of the play. 
fugitive vocabulary, mud, sorrow. No need to recount the obvious denouement. They say we're good with numbers. I'm not the one to prove them wrong. We own empires of shame, longing, and disaster, all good bonds in the market world. Always already outside the line, the teacher's ring finger flies like a flag in your face. Would I seek this image to install the spectacle of that other sum, ominous, numerous clauses, locked number, programmed to remove you from the bench of being? Don't worry, hush a baby. I won't quote from the interminable code of exclusion. Let the stranger practice her night scales. Let the other find his doorstep with the rest. And one last. This is a scene four. This is a scene where nothing happens. That thing we call theater is a transit where words pass on the way to silence. Kay and the writer sit on steps of cardboard, orange crates, blankets stained with blood, flowers crushed beyond recognition, might as well be rice or confetti while wishes throat on the bride. Sheets of time folded and refolded to mark movement, mechanical stairs emerging from the deep metro and going back down exactly the same way into the forest, little rocks we place to find our way. Go away. There's nothing for you here, nothing to put down in your big register, no names, no dates, I remember nothing. My throat is plugged up like an old laundry tub, black stocking twisted around the pipes. A hole, I tell you, seven feet deep with straight walls, really a well, the voices fall in the dark. We'll do it out of sequence, cross-hatch the narrative with ghouls and corpses, wounds and gauze, impossible. You have no idea. The minute you utter a word or stand next to the place where they were, you walk into a wall. The words harden. I need a blank, naked, abandoned lot. The ruined memory, please, spare us. Thank you very much. People want more than mise en scène. I mean it. You better leave. Let them stuff an onion into their mouth. We married no one. One should never talk about this. You hear never. It's a fucking disgrace, this habit of always blabbing as if under a spell, laughing gas or ether, getting it right, approaching the truth. What a joke. It's not a wisdom tooth for Christ's sake, not a tattoo either. When what do you want? An empty page smack in the middle of the book, is that it? A bloody outline? Little vials with dust and ashes? A tin box, scotch tape, scotch taper all around, smudgy label in its center, spelling sickness, or better yet, death? Small bottle of paint rattling inside? What color was it? What hue should murder be, Miss said design? It wouldn't be fair to black, always pounding on the same body, remember? In boarding school, hours were under lock and key. We could only open them under the supervision of the witch with the long gray hair, Madame Gilda, the one who withheld my mail if I didn't finish my asparagus, dark chocolate, biscuits, our tiny share of sweetness we nibble at allotted times, chewing our misery behind her back. Yes, that's precisely it. You will write with your eyes shut. I'll pin them myself if I have to. No markers, no way to stretch your arms across the map. Illegible, gone to the dogs, tatters. What do you care? It's not a documentary. You don't know where you're going. Try crawling through the sewer. Above, men in leather coats and yellow gloves inspect papers. Peer with such concentration as if examining a rare stamp. Of course you have no pass, no key, not even a sense of what they search for you in your face. Such pretty eyes, the tall one says, holding you by the chin. So schön für eine, you don't hear the verboten word at the end of the compliment. Take your fake goods elsewhere while they sharpen their knives. The streets look unfamiliar, crude like in a dream. Where are all the houses, shops? Schools you used to know, floorboards ripped to shreds, loose bricks everywhere, charred bundles, could it, there, these aren't showers, are they beds? What do you see under your blindfold memosine? Do you hear anything? Trains in the night? Is it far yet? Is it far yet? Who do you think you are, la petite Jeanne de France? 
I give up then, gag, tomb, silence. That's what you wanted all along. Cut out my tongue, dig a grave. Be quiet, someone's coming. Thank you. So now for a change of pace, uh, I'm going to read from uh, a three-book uh, uh, project, which is entitled Hôtel des Archives, and which uh, consists of uh, not translating, but uh, I call it a transcreating. What I'm doing is I've taken three uh, novels, which were written in French, and I've taken each one and transposed it into a poem. So I'm, I'm doing two slides at a time. One slide is from a genre, because I'm moving from the genre of prose, fiction that is, into poetry. And the other slide is the one of languages as I'm moving from French to English. So uh, Trisha mentioned I was a translator, and it's true that I'm a translator. Sometimes uh, uh, I translate uh, other people's work. Uh, but this is really something, uh, this is a creation, even though the, the point of departure is already there for me. So it's a very conceptual kind of work. And the, the, the first uh, one I did that with was the Samuel Beckett a book called Molloy, uh, and, um, which is part of uh, his trilogy, and I'm calling it uh, Molloy, the flip side. And uh, I'm using a three-line uh, stanza to, uh, articulate this kind of existentialist uh, drama that uh, Beckett imagines for his hapless hero, uh, slowly going nowhere, but of course he has first to see someone, that someone is his mother. Um, so I'll read a few. Um, this was an extremely uh, joyful, uh, jubilant kind of exercise for me because it allowed me to uh, uh, resort to uh, a lot of humor. Usually my <laughs> work is not that humorous, uh, but I find Beckett really a riot. And also I could swear and use slang, and so it was, it was just too much fun. So anyway, I I'll read some of it. In the din chamber, mother sets my vice, a little bed of needles, I have no fucking idea how I got here. Someone called 911, Ma's aide maybe. Send him a strong current, check the floor for balance. He swears no way, hands over a few bucks and picks up the stack. Tin full, tin darts, we jet and unravel evidence, a nest of imports so they say, what's what now, speak. Gotta check out soon, be done with dying. What they read the signs, parrots mess, a broken sink. My legs bid adieu. Who am I kidding? Haven't done squat in weeks, can't read his chicken scrawl. He barks, why not? I write mortar for mortal without wanting to correct my mistake like a stranger in the dark forest. I piss on words, vase, bed, same struggle, only plusher. A relation of sorts, I spun was somewhere. He'd be an old fart now, not the grand love you write. See a pretty bonnet, a crumb? I lifted her rug so tiny and slanted toward the door. If I'm not mistaken, I've known him, my son that is. Crap, I forget his name again. The question bars my way. Every stump, every bit of damp muck wants to be born. All goes blank. Any minute now I'll go bat blind. Then the head and empty pot will follow. Pains I'll use stick in my throat where they make a fist as if to say, we'll show you. Did you say what I think I heard? Fault? Boo-boo? Blunder? Sit up? Do you still use such slurs? At this moment, peepholes like trowels drain light, leaky little eaves in the bed of the sea, that neither tavern nor black weeds, only A and B in an empty field, till the cow drags its ass home. It's the fixity of the empty set, a bit self-conscious of standing for the twisty bleak road ahead. No doubt about it, there were two of them. They had just met in a ditch wearing coats because of the weather. 
The brute measure of stomping feet beneath means nothing yet. By dawn, they'll speak some. It's not like they're buddies waiting for a pint or a handshake on the way to the office. The treason of hills finds a path, no doubt, from his bedroom, where he guesses flanks, crests, and valleys rise indigo even. Even if it were the caverns of his heart, the black crevasse he roams at night, pressing his stick, I'm ashamed to say once level and stout, now a mere shadow where I crouch, but the cigar and the breach, like a corkscrew in my gut, sand, ashes, and dust of fallen things. The fuming hand, mangy skin, all right, I stink. My crutches scrape as I try to ask him, please do this and that, east of history. I miss stuff, the very alphabet, a large glass, somebody left in the alley, shit. I hate talking about myself, since every I is a he. Look, he split. Should I be watching him still? To row in silence toward the world of object is to wish a story resembled them but better. Whereas I'm at bottom. I mean, literally, that's my crib, somewhere between scum and mire. B, isn't it? Among chariots and the rah-rah of carts leaving town before dawn? It could happen. Then a series of bangs taps out next part, fraps as with ropes or cables, nightly mares that race mad around the bend. I wonder what the hell that means. Let's blow this joint. I've got places to be, my mother's to be blunt about it. No need to remark a certain blue hour when I mount the shaky premise I'll call here after a bike. And don't ask how I tie my crutches, nor how I pedal with one leg slightly less stiff than the other. Ah, the little red horn, who gives a rat's ass? Who hears the crake's awful racket in the grain fields? A chain of events I imagine within the strict compass of my journey caked with darkness, sans sex, sans parent. The thing is mother and I, my shitty start. I'm so old now we like the we like two seer fucks on the rail, dilapidated ma, mag, hello, caca countess, poor fit of flesh and bone, we'll skip the introductions, go straight to the empty sweep of eyes, knobby knees, pressed together, and the manic lift of her dentures, a short rap to the skull means yes, no, maybe. I mime the answers with my hands, lest she mix up the banknotes for the crust of bread she shoves in. It's not her money I'm after, gray soft sack, and yet I'll crawl back like a mugger in the night. But enough about her. Let's go to the funky road bazaar at the edge of town. Purple flowers a little further on mark the way. Vats and papers in the traffic aisle, like pastry doilies, I vaguely think. Oh no, the copper wants the other paper with my mug on it. It's the law, he says, for richer or poorer, lame or not. Up to the station we must go. I remember that much. The air is kind under the blue sky of the policeman's eye. Could it be the quarter of slaughterhouse, gaslight and blunt instruments? Forget about it. I told you I have blanks in this area, minus the fact I'm dying to sit down, although it's a canned image, blue and gold from before, the somber soil saw a crisscross, a fan of figures from liquid to coarse crooks, shuffling in place. In the aha moment that follows, I blurt out, Molo is the name. Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Commissar, roughly speaking, though free to go, I understood my body's dumb trespass on decency, does nothing to ease the long theory I sit on like an abandoned subway station, toothless and lost to the world of putrid chairs, blanched facade and the hazy cutout of me and my bike. All that nonsense at the precinct, like kicking a dead horse, excites my hunger big time. Hold on, now come the... Hold on, now comes the famous passage of sucking stones. I move from pocket to mouth and back again. A suggestion of cinnamon passes my senses. The most stranded of organs left high and dry. Hobbling, I make for the judicious empty bed on the white hawthorn, a fistful of grass on my tongue. Take it easy, pal. 
You can still spread your toes and hear the wind howl. It's not over till the fat lady sings or the flies buzz or someone draws the blinds or whatever the fuck that's scary. It's not that eerie hour's martyr light, nor the stone remains of a house in the slow effacement of a name. But just before a singular night, there by the side of a canal full of shadows against my thoughts, which trail off like comet ends, having already done their share of fixing the thin rain that falls. I'll stop here for this. And I'm sorry, I forgot that I was going to ask you to read the French. Uh, tu vas lire le jeûner. Um, so my, um, second, uh, my second volume in Hôtel des Archives is, is uh, a book uh, which, I'm, which is based on uh, Jean Genet's uh, novel uh, entitled Our Lady of the Flowers, which he wrote in 1943 inside a French prison, literally on paper bags. It's an uh, extremely transgressive uh, work. Uh, of, of great lyricists already, so um, I, and it, it's, it's really kind of an onanistic uh, uh, act uh, to cheat his uh, solitude, so there, there isn't really uh, much of uh, uh, action going on, but what little action there is, I kind of follow the, that diegetic arc. So I, I would like George to uh, read a little bit of the French so you have the, the sound since I'm following the French. So I think that would be good. Uh, this will be just a, a paragraph from the first page. Weidmann vous a apparu dans une édition de cinq heures, la tête émaillotée de bandelettes blanches, religieuse et encore aviateur blessé, tombé dans les seigles, un jour de septembre pareil à celui où fut connu le nom de Notre-Dame des Fleurs. Son beau visage multiplié par les machines s'abattit sur Paris et sur la France, au plus profond des villages perdus, dans les châteaux et les chaumières, Révelant aux bourgeois attristés que leur vie quotidienne est frôlée d'assassins enchanteurs, élevés surnoisement jusqu'à leur sommeil, qu'ils vont traverser par quelque escalier d'office qui, complice pour eux, n'a pas grincé. Sous son image, éclatés d'horreur ses crimes, meurtre 1, meurtre 2, meurtre 3 et jusqu'à 6, disait sa gloire secrète et préparer sa gloire future. So uh, what's interesting uh, in uh, Jean Genet, uh, who was uh, partially uh, taught by a priest, a kind of very classical education, that you have this classical, very written type of French. It's not spoken, it's not informal, it's on the contrary very uh, literary, very written, and very classical. And then you have this uh, you know, gay, transgressive camp, criminal uh, uh, element in it. So the, the, the mixture is really interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll read a few. Um, so I, I chose a seven line stanza, so it's capacious enough to uh, locate all this uh, material. Um, I guess I'll start from the beginning. On the news, Weidmann, his head like a nun in white or a wounded pilot, falls down in silky rye. The same day Our Lady of the Flowers stamped all over France, dangles his crimes by a golden string. Nimble assassins mount the back stairs of our sleep. There were others, of course, orphan fragments I overhear prisoners sing inside when voices rise in psalm from the depth of their misery. Each time my heart bangs like it did when the German dropped his bomb and I smiled, a tiny sign between us. 
It can't be pure chance that I cut out those handsome heads with empty eyes or rather sky blue windows on the construction site not yet up. Who said vacant? When their eyes do close, it's creepier than a viper's nest to the girl who walks by the bar spy hole. That each cell becomes to where strange types crash, swear and dream on straw pallets, or maybe something of a confession booth with its dark screen. Empty theaters, deserted prisons, idle machinery, those eyes hold me in trance and I feel my way groping along like a blind man until in wild panic I arrive by a sordid alley face to face with nothing but a void propped and swollen like a huge foxglove, the paper thorn sheared of their pimps like a May garden looted of its blossoms. It is you I remember at night stretched like a coffin at sea pale and wintry. You flow into me, white blessed body, now a halo, supernatural cocoon you prick with both your feet. Out of chewed bread I make glue for my cutouts. Some I pin with brass wire that inmates use for funeral wreath, now star-shaped frames for the criminal element. I live here among runes, smiles, or pouts, all enter through my open pores, myself, my family. To give them their due, their retinue, I've added a few profiles from those cheap paperbacks we smuggle in the yard, young half-breed or Apache with a hard-on. Under the sheets I choose my nightly outlaw, caress his absent face, and the body which resists at first opens up like a mirror armoire that falls out of the wall and pins me on a stained mat where I think of God and his angels come at last. With the help of my unknown lovers, nobody can say when and if I'll get out. I'll compose a story. My heroes are stuck on the wall, and I in lockdown. As you read about Divine and Cula Froid, you might at times hear lines mixed in with a drop of blood, an exclamation point. In a drowsy morning, as the screw throws in his low bonjour, the fact of a few pink girls, now white corpses, flows through an ineffable fairy tale I tell in my own words for the enchantment of my cell. Divine died yesterday. In a pool of blood more red, you would see Jesus or a flam flying over the sacred heart, her lungs like a piece of evidence in the judge's chamber squeezed shut, now it rains behind bars, wind too. A spiral stairway leads to the attic, overlooking a small Montmartre cemetery where Dee lived for a spell. It will be the anteroom of her crypt, thick with putrid flowers and incense, floor to floor it rises to her death, and then at the top no more than a phantom shadow, tinged with blue, while outside let sit under the black canopy of tiny umbrellas, mimosa one, mimosa two, mimosa half, four, first communion, Angela, her highness, Castagnette and Regine, a weight holding sprays of violets, all the queens, boys and girls that there nodded together, chattering and tweeting pearl tiaras on their heads. I let myself sink to my old village graveyard where snails and slugs leave trails of slime on white flagstones. Poor darling, can you beat it? She was losing it. Where's Mignon? Any minute now there'll be a black horse procession and the rest by way of Rachel Avenue. Oh, this scene. The Eternal makes his entrance smiling, supple and elegant without a hat. They call him Mignon Dainty Feet. In the rectangle of my door, I thought I saw him once like a dead man walking on pricey furs. In a flash, I'm his, discharged to the core. Not a dab of self remains but ruffian, pimp, and gangster. He's lodged instead his lacy fingers. Baby Jesus in its crib received the world as he moves through the queens like a shiny slaughterhouse knife. They part and recast in silence their traveling line. Two at a time, he runs up the steps, lifted, I have said, to the house of death, now real as tears, flowers, and mourning veil. Old Ernestine, Divine's mother, though still a beauty, was done for having ransacked a thousand and one rolls from pulp novels that corrupt their real. Yeah. 
gun and gloved hand, she stages her son's denouement the way others shoot up smack with a crystal spike. The room slides like a diamond on her index finger into gold, velvet, and walnut paneled walls. I feel it, Lou's hour has come, she moans using the boy's old name, buried ax at the bottom of a pool. The whole construction bound to shatter her nerves, feeling faint amid hangings, beveled mirrors, and gloom's infernal ruckus. In two seconds flat, she recovers her cool, would go first lighter than thought and wait by the coffin, gray shape now. That's how Mignon saw her, drunk with grief like a queen of spades, black widow of dry wings spread across the bed curtains, walls, and rugs that were death's private seal stamped low on the parchment. Some stray dogs like to repeat such news, scent of sulfur in the air. Already Mignon forgets the pad he shared with D, will not linger near the lacy shroud. He's simply drifting about, Outside, a black cortege rouge and blush finally arrives by the pit already dug, and Divine is no more dead and buried. I'll read another excerpt. Uh, let's see. Mignon has been in the pen three months when he heard about Our Lady from a kid in the parlor. Everything I will tell you, A to Z, he'd learned by bits and scraps, words whispered behind a hand spread like a fan. Here's the scene. Our Lady, whose dealer moniker is Pete the Corsican, and the kid hear the doorbell. Police, one of the men says, turning up his badge. One has to have a pixie soul to mix everyday life, buttons to sew, laces to tie, black heads to squeeze with detective novels. The cops enter at once smelling crime. The fact is they're right because the kid's studio has the same choking air, roses and arum lilies on the mantelpiece as when Our Lady strangled the old man. In the middle of the room, a naked body lay flat. The idea of sham murder made the police ill at ease. Yet they quickly see the corpse is nothing more than a tailor's dummy. All they want is the coke. The one of their snitches has tracked down to the kid. Give me the dope. He holds out a tiny packet. What about him? He's got nothing, chief. What in the hell is that? A mannequin. Divine's aura hangs like a scarf, absurd and inexplicable veil. One night, the two kids had stolen from a park card a cardboard box. Upon opening, they found the dreadful parts of a wax doll. Fake or not, the cops take both back to the station, kicks in the belly, slaps upside the head, ribs, and other places. Confess, they scream. Finally, our lady rolls under the table. Enraged, a policeman dives after him, but another holds him back by the sleeve. Let go, Gobert. It's not like he killed someone. That cute mug? He could do it, believe you me. Shaking like a leaf, our lady crawls out from underneath. After all, it's just cocaine. You're not going to the guillotine, the good cop says, handing him a cig. The thing that pissed him off is your dummy. Straining against his teeth, the murder confession rises in him like smoke. If he opens his mouth now, he's done for, sentenced to death. I'm only 18, I can't die yet, he thinks quickly. God, not a word. He's safe. The confession pulls back like a tide. I killed the old man. What old man? Our lady laughs out loud. I'm kidding, come on. But these people want to know. The detectives shout names from the last 10 years. Cold cases of violent death pass before his eyes. It's a guessing game. Am I hot, dragon? A drowned child on the shore, undone, incomprehensible face. Yes, that's him. Everything goes blank. Okay. So, uh, just one more. Uh, 
So the, the last volume uh, of uh, Hôtel des Archives is a transcreation of Marguerite Duras uh, novel, uh, The Ravishment of Lal V. Stein. Uh, it's a novel of uh, female voyeurism and um, I'm uh, choosing uh, as my uh, structure here a couplet and um, it, it offers kind of attention for the, for the trio. There's a threesome uh, that triangulates desire in this novel. Um, and um, I just received a, a publication uh, from Bard College, which is a great uh, journal called Conjunctions. And um, so I can read uh, from here. I just came in yesterday. Um, and uh, you, you have to know that the, the prose of Marguerite Duras, as uh, some of you uh, know already, uh, is extremely sparse and melodic. And that was the biggest challenge of the three because uh, it's quasi-poetry. Uh, so what am I to do? <laughs> like some, it, it, it's extremely difficult. It, this section is called As If Stitching a Sheet. As soon as she sees him come out of the theater, Lull recognizes the men in the dark of her mind. Something incendiary, no doubt, rapacious leaps out from the eye. The way he looks at women, wanting more with g each gaze, enough to recall the one she'd known before the ball. Maybe she's wrong. What heat and fatigue. She'd gladly slide this heavy brooding right here in the street. I see the following. The man has a few minutes to kill before his rendezvous. Scanning the boulevard, a vague hope Lull finds divine of meeting yet another girl than the one she spied in the garden. In tune with his step, she tells him at a distance, intense on placing her feet in the same black prints as if stitching a sheet with big hasty needles. She must be wearing those flat ballet shoes I imagine or invent, a gray coat, maybe a hat, that can be taken off any minute to pass out of sight, indiscernible, like a blade under the tongue. Roving eyes, he ferrets the teeming square, mourning every woman in advance of the one who doesn't exist yet, for whom he could at the last minute ditch the very lover they both await. Given the black and vaporous mass of hair, that small triangular face and immense eyes outlined by the ineffable guilt of this adulterous body, given unlimited funds of soft round hips as, this, as she steps down from the bus against the crowd, golden combs to the side of a dark voilette, he will be the only one to free in a single gesture that goes snap around the shoulders inside a minuscule cry. They are together, trains, winds, heartbeats, a summer solstice come to as if pushed by the same high tide. On the surface of an inlet, sensation of thirst misread again. Lull will have easily guessed the name that trails there. Spell or apparition had known it for weeks now. The round vowel sounds dance on pursed lips. Tatiana Carl's migratory beauty approaches the forest hotel, past waving all the trees and a large naked field of rye. Sheets of ice, one could say, where she'd gone up in her youth with Richardson, forgotten about, crystal cup, she spins under her footsteps, no use to shadow them too close since she knows where they're headed, how she lowers herself flat, out barely visible dark stain, in milky green shadow a few feet from the light that just went up on the third floor. At this distance, she can't hear them and only catches a glimpse if one of them crosses the room up and down, a bluish shape holding a cigarette, elbows on the sill. Smooth as a stone, Tatiana reappears in the frame. Night has come mixed with lies about a greenhouse on the edge of town, accounting for Lola's return at such a late hour. Husband and children pity her numb hands, can't help believing her tall tale, almost lost the thread. And I'll read one more section. Um, 
tossed from self to other. What happens next at the Bedford house is hard to explain, even less form a contiguous shape that curves around the guest, wavy and restive balls on a pool table about to break. It's a question of who sees whom outside the fan of windows skirting the ground. The women are poised by French doors, voices looped together like an étude à quatre mains. In truth, it's the husband's violin we hear bursting from the upper floors. Jean has a concert tomorrow, Lol explains, stroking Tatiana's hair. Something strange, a sudden proximity of opposites begins a drift an arc that cuts flower beds, tears apart what's left of truth. A hide bent over to better hear a sweet venom. Not sure I can visit as often. I have lovers, you know. Tatiana's pink mouth pouts velvety phonemes. In this blind man's bluff, it is Lola Stein who is it, we think and maybes, infinitely translatable language, temporal and, and deictic as here and there. When I look up again from behind the bay window, Lull's eyes seek mine, belying a certain gaze theory, the consoling fiction men wear like an armband. Here I am again, stepping into a bayou, deep mossy folds, where love changes hands and color over black and blue skies. On the periphery of her lie, I shall howl and be quartered in the white sense of the word. She utters to prove she's back among us. I've met someone recently. Having just smelt a burning house, Tatiana feels like shouting, watch out, Lola. Instead, she turns to her Jack Holt. Shall we go? He says no, like a convalescent stretching his long legs. Thank you.